Now, I don't want to scare you with the title of this today, The Coming Destruction of the Baptist People. There is coming a destruction for the entire world. The Antichrist is coming. We believe Jesus could return at any time. And uh, the Antichrist will come on the scene and he'll destroy what's left of the religious systems in the world and take over uh, himself. So that day is coming. We won't be there for the final part of it. But uh, one of the goals of, of trying to present this work and, and getting this out among people is, uh, is that so we don't help the Antichrist. We don't have to do things to help him. Uh, and we are. We're starting to do some things that are helping his cause. And so we want to talk about that. I'm just going to pray and get right into it, all right? Why don't we just do it that way, all right? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us today. Holy Spirit of God, we're so grateful for these men of God that have come our way. And Lord, for these students that are here, there are parents here and concerned folks. And Lord, we want to thank you for what you uh, allowed us to do last night. Lord, the people there were so gracious and so kind. And Lord, thank you for Brother Hammett and for his, Lord, his, his uh, uh, vision, and Lord, his, his concern for this very thing, thing, Lord, through the years. He's not a newcomer to this Lord, he's been doing this for many, many years, and we're grateful for his testimony. Lord, his burden for this. And we pray that, Lord, today that you'd open our hearts, open our ears, help us to learn some things today. Lord, help it to change our behavior and our outlook. And God, give us grace. God, we pray that you'd help us leave here not discouraged, but encouraged about serving you and seeing people come to Christ. Please help us and give us an understanding heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our little uh, presentation here is called The Coming Destruction of the Baptist People. I'd like to introduce you to our, our family. This is, uh, this is, can we get a couple of these lights off up on the platform? We can see this a little bit better, I think. Um, this, this is my family. My oldest son is uh, in Bible college in Michigan, and, and my youngest daughter is getting ready to join him up in Michigan. And, there's Katie Baby, and that's our, that's our family, four kids and my lovely wife. And uh, this is our church in Arnold. This is the Arnold Baptist Tabernacle. Now, this uh, picture was taken a couple years ago. We've seen a little bit of growth since then. But these are some marvelous people uh, that have a burden for souls. And I will tell you that uh, becoming involved in Baptist heritage was a result of doing a little study on my own uh, that resulted in the book, The, the Soul of St. Louis. And after I wrote that book, I, I became very discouraged, and I felt as though the Lord wasn't using us much. And so <clears throat> I decided I was going to quit, maybe go somewhere else. And someone invited me on a Baptist history tour, and uh, actually, Brother Faggart flew me to North Carolina, didn't even know me, flew me to North Carolina. And from there, we went with a group of preachers. We were flown to New England, and uh, there for the first time, in my life, I was introduced to men like John Leland, Obadiah Holmes, and others that should be household names to us. And I went to the grave of Valentine Whiteman, who is buried over in Groton, uh, Connecticut. And there I learned about Valentine's life, how he had pastored the same church for 40 some odd years, and how his son became the pastor after he passed away, pastored the same church for 40 some odd years. And then his grandson became the pastor, pastor for another 40 some odd years. And so from that one family, over 125 years of service to a Baptist pulpit in one town. And uh, I knelt by the grave of Valentine Whiteman and told the Lord that if Valentine could stay for 40 some odd years in this place, that I could probably stay in St. Louis for a little bit longer. And the Lord's been very, very good to us. After that trip, our church was transformed into a a, uh, uh, a church planting ministry. And we got busy right away starting churches. I don't know, Brother Hammett, uh, I thought when I was in Bible college, I thought I was going to run 10,000, you know. I was going to put Lee Robertson to shame, you know. I was going to show Jack Hiles how to do it, you know. And, and, uh, and one day, about 10 years into my ministry, I sat up in bed and I said, you know what, I don't think I'm ever going to get to 10,000. Um, I was trying hard, uh, and I was waiting till we had a thousand or so to birth another church because I always thought that that's what we ought to do. But after coming back and learning about the separate Baptist revival and learning about Shubal Starnes and other great Baptist preachers of the past, it transformed our church into a soul winning church. And we began right away uh, planting churches. This is Shubal, by the way. This is a sketch of Shubal Starnes. You say, who's Shubal Starnes? Shubal Starnes is the greatest man of God this country's ever produced. 
You say, I never heard of him. Okay, well, it's about time you learned out who he is. Amen. Amen. He came from Connecticut to North Carolina, began preaching there. The Lord gave him 17 preachers. Those 17 preachers birthed 128 churches. Those 128 churches in turn birthed over 1,000 churches. And within two generations, over 5,000 churches were birthed out of the separate Baptist revival. That's our legacy. That is our history. And it, that's what we should be teaching our children and especially our preacher boys. How many of you guys are preacher boys? Amen. Any preacher boys in here? Raise your hand. If you're a preacher boy, stand up. Here, here comes a bunch of preacher boys right now, coming right down the center aisle. You're a preacher boy. All right. Listen, you need to learn about Shubal and the separate Baptist revival. And uh, it'll, it'll transform your life. It really will. It transformed our, uh, the life of our church. We began planting churches right away. The first one was planted in 1999. These are all in the St. Louis area. And when I say we plant a church, uh, we don't throw a couple thousand dollars at a guy and say, go do it. What we do is we come alongside the preacher and we do what's called sit as a church. And a portion of our church goes out each week. It's not always the same portion. We'll send two families, three families, and we'll go and actually sit in the services Go soul winning with that preacher. Uh, we provide housing and a place to meet for the preacher in the first year which, and, uh, and groceries and so forth. And our entire church will, will, will help in the planting of a church. Come along some guy and really help him. Uh, this is the second church plant. It's in the city of St. Louis. It was started in the year 2000. Uh, the third one was planted also in St. Louis. This young man came from North Carolina. And the Lord's using him in a great way. Um, this church plant was, uh, uh, took place in Farmington, and probably of all of the church plants, this is the one we had, we didn't have to work quite as hard on this one. Our young people went out, and the truth is, the preacher, these are all the, the kids of the preacher, he built a church just by moving his family to Farmington, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so that one that was very difficult. And then this, this was an amazing church plant that uh, just last year the Lord gave us a permanent pastor. I preached there on Sunday afternoon for almost a whole year, and the Lord gave us this building. It's just a wonderful thing. And so we've been busy doing it. Now, why did we get into that? We got into it because we learned about our heritage. Yes. Yes. And to me, information is meaningless unless it moves you to do something for the Lord. So God's been good to us, and the field is white unto harvest. And brother, you mentioned uh, the greatest English-speaking mission field is Whitehall. You're right. And that's the way it is all over the country, by the way. Amen. Well, this is our family, and this is what the Lord's allowed us to do, different stuff with, with uh, uh, Prairie Fire Press. Uh, this book, uh, American Crimson Red, came out uh, a year and a half ago. The Lord's used that book in a great way, and uh, it's being used now in, in 28 Baptist colleges across the country. We're very, very thankful and grateful for that. It gives us our Baptist heritage. Amen. tells us the story. And... Uh, that we should all be familiar with. And then this is what the Lord has directed us to do. Because we were out speaking here and there, people would come and they would say, how come we never heard of Shubal Starnes? How come we've never heard of the separates? How come we don't even know who Isaac Backus is or Isaac McCoy is or Jeremiah? How, why? Why don't we know? And so I began to dig into that a little bit. And the Lord uh, allowed me to come across a, a lot of pertinent information. And that's what this briefing is all about. All right. Y'all with me? Let's test our knowledge of our roots. Ready? Here we go. And I know you kids are thinking, man, I thought we were going to get a break. Now we're going to have to have a test. Okay, that's all right. Um, you don't have to write any of this down. But can you name an ancient Baptist group from the Dark Ages? Waldensians, Albigensians. If you can at least mention those, you're, you're ahead of the game in this, all right? Can you, what is an Anabaptist? And are Baptists and the Anabaptists the same? Well, in my research, I found that they are nearly identical in their beliefs and, uh, and that we are uh, related to them spiritually. True or false, Baptists are Reformed. I believe that's false. Um, true or false, Luther, Calvin, and the Reformers had great love for the Baptists. <laughs> that's false. All right. You've, some of you folks have been reading. It's very good. All right. It's refreshing. All right. True or false, Baptist... Luther, uh, Baptist, Luther, and Calvin are nearly identical in doctrine? We're not, all right. Uh, true or false, there were no great Baptist evangelists during the great revivals. Now, this one's a little bit hard because I don't know how many times I heard in Bible college, oh, there were no great Baptist evangelists. And uh, now I know that, that there were plenty, we just don't know who they are. 
and we need to find out who they are. We need to teach our children who they are. Can you name a great Baptist uh, Christian evangelist from 1755 to 1899? Last night, somebody said D.L. Moody. <laughs> Moody wasn't a Baptist. Okay. Right. Some, I've heard people tell me, well, it was uh, Talmadge, uh, or how about uh, Sam Jones, or how about none of, none of these people that we know that are household names to us were Baptist preachers. Now, I'm not saying they were bad men. I don't think they were. I think they were great men, but they didn't suffer like our forefathers suffered. All right. Can you name a, gr a great Baptist Christian theologian? That's harder, isn't it? It's, get, it's getting tougher. Who is Obadiah Holmes? Obadiah Holmes was a great Baptist preacher who suffered for the cause of Christ right here in Boston. He was beat half to death in 1651 for, uh, for holding an unauthorized Baptist service in town. And only by the grace of God did he survive that beating. He wasn't the only one that was beaten. Uh, who was Dr. John Clark? He is the founder of the First Baptist Church in America and also was the man that directed the first revival service in, the, in what is now the United States. Who was Daniel Marshall? Probably the greatest Baptist evangelist this country has ever produced. He went to Georgia at age 65, Brother Hammett. That gives me a lot of hope. At age 65, and he birthed dozens of churches in Georgia and throughout the South. And uh, is really responsible for what we call the Bible Belt. What part did John Gano and John Leland play in the American Revolution? Well, Gano baptized Washington. And Leland, of course, was personal friends with Madison and brokered the Bill of Rights. These things are not, and by the way, I've done research on this. This is not just somebody's idea that somebody threw out. This is documented history. This actually happened. What great Baptist pastor was used of God to birth a thousand churches in one generation? That's Shubal Starnes. Now, on the, on the left-hand side, these are very common names to all of us. Most of us know David Brainerd, Finney, Moody, and all. These are very, very common names. And these, I believe, are great men, but none of these are Baptist men. These are the evangelists that we talk about all the time. We use them in our sermon illustrations. We just keep talking about these guys and talking about them. But I want to bring to your attention, this is a group of wonderful men over here on the right that we never mention. And these are Baptist preachers that preached either at the same time or they were contemporaries or they, or, or they did a, a work for God related. David Brainerd, who we all know about, uh, the truth is David Brainerd didn't birth one church. He might have led maybe a couple of Indians to Christ, but Isaac McCoy birthed dozens. We don't even know how many churches Isaac McCoy birthed, uh, uh, and, and we don't even know how many Indians he led to Christ. We know it's in the hundreds, maybe even thousands of Indians he led to Christ, including Indian chiefs in which the entire tribe would get saved after the chief would get saved. This is a Baptist preacher whom we should be very familiar with. We don't know anything about him at all. By the grace of God, we're gonna, we want, want the Lord to change those things, help us to change those things. Amen. Jeremiah Vardaman preached at the same time as Finney. Vardaman baptized 10,000 people in the wilderness in a 10-year period. I don't even know how he found the streams to baptize everybody. But what a marvelous, wonderful man. Jabez Swan, Alfred Taylor, and so forth. These are our Baptist con uh, counterpoints. We'll get in. Now, here's what I'm not trying to do. Now, I, don't, I want everybody to understand that I'm not, I don't, I'm not, here, I'm not here to start a, a fight with Baptist people. I'd like to fight, start a fight with other people. But, but I'm, I'm not trying to divide anybody. As a matter of fact, I think, I think as we learn more about our heritage, it will actually have a unifying effect on us. I'm not trying to divide anybody. I'm not trying to hurt the Christian school movement. You'll see why I'm saying this in a few minutes. I'm not trying to accuse those in a textbook ministry of deceit. And I'm not trying to damage the mem memory of the old fundamentalists. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to get us reconnected with some things. And we'll see here in just a second. In Hosea 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's how we get destroyed. Because we just don't know some things. All right? Now, I want you to look at this verse as well. If you have your Bible, if you want to turn to Revelation 12 and, and verse number 11, this is a very famous verse. And uh, this is the theme verse behind the, our briefing here today. The Bible says in Revelation 12, can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. Did he turn it up? Oh, could, could you turn it up a little bit? Some folks are having a hard time. Over here in Revelation 12, in verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of, blood of the Lamb. Who is they? It's talking about the tribulation saints overcoming him. Who's him? Satan. 
and the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. They overcame Satan, or they're going to. This is a future, this is a future act that is actually written as though it happened already. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So we, under, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb as well, amen? If you're saved, you're saved by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We all know that, amen? That's not foreign to us. But notice the second weapon here in overcoming the devil is the word of their testimony. Now, that's not just talking about your personal testimony. That's talking about your heritage. And we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, but we also, as a tool, have our own testimony of our own people, our own history and our own heritage that tells us and, and gives us examples. And we know that there are Bible examples. But there, is all, there are also examples of, of God's people throughout the ages on how they handled the Antichrist, how they handled the spirit of the Antichrist, and how they handled the devil. And I believe that we have been severed from one of those tools. We don't even know our heritage. We don't even know how in, in history how our people handled uh, uh, when the spirit of Antichrist came to them. And because of that, we've been severed from one of the tools that God intends for us to use in our lives. Amen. We'll see how this has damaged us. Now, our main characters in our, in our briefing are Baptist Christians, of course. Hooray. Amen. Then there's the Roman Catholics. And then there are the Catholic Reformed. These are Calvinists and Lutherans, Anglicans and Presbyterians. And there's, a, there's another group that we're going to discuss. And that is the Reformed Reconstructionists. Now, this is a group of of reformers. Um, I like to call them reformers on steroids um, because they, I mean, they're very serious about what they do and they kind of have a stealth operation going. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but these are people that really mean business about predestination, you know, and uh, we'll discuss them in just a little while. Now, um, reconstructionists are Calvinists who believe in theonomy and theocracy. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Now, um, while wow, we, you know, you know what happened? We lost, we lost this a little bit, but that's okay. These are three theologians you ought to remember. On the left is Augustine. In the middle is John Calvin. And then on the right is somebody that's maybe not that well known. His name ought to be over there. That's R.J. Rushduni. Now these theologians, we need to be familiar with them, but, but we all need to understand that when you, if you boil down Calvin and Rushduni, you're going to get Augustine. And you're going to get Augustinian thought, and we're going to, we're going to cover that thought. Listen, I, I hope this isn't too deep for you. You should be able to understand a little bit about theology. That's right. Amen. And young people, listen, if you don't learn doctrine and theology, you're going to wind up in some goofball church yeah. out of the will of God, not knowing what the Word of God says about right. things. You're going to be unaware, and it's going to damage your testimony. It's going to damage your family one day. Yes. You need to listen and pay attention. Amen. Now, here's four disturbing facts uh, today for all of us. First of all, Baptist Christians don't know their own heritage. That ought to scare you a little bit. I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar, if, if you, look, if you've never heard of Shubal Starnes, that's something wrong with that. If you've never heard of John Leland, maybe you heard a little bit about him, but you, if, if you have never heard of these great Baptist evangelists, there's something wrong here. Secondly, Baptists are starting to embrace somebody else's theology. And I would call that a worldview. That's very popular among uh, our homeschool and Christian school curriculum nowadays. Uh, number three, the Baptist educational system's been reconstructed. You say, howdy duty, what do you mean about that? I'll show you in a few minutes. Number four, Baptists have forfeited their place of spiritual leadership in America. I believe that America is a Baptist nation. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Now, how did these facts become facts? Well, what happened to us is we became severed from our roots. Um, here's a famous person. Uh, well, uh, we, we saw this verse a minute ago. I'll, I'll skip over that. But Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, to destroy a people, you must first sever their roots. Now, he ought to know he saw Russia severed from its roots and the Communist Party come in and, and destroy what was left of that nation. And uh, if you want to destroy somebody, just as the Bible says that they overcame the devil by the word of their testimony, the word of, of, uh, the, word of the testimony of the ancient Baptist and, and, and the American separate Baptist, those are our roots. And if you sever us from those roots, it'll be easy to separate us from our testimony and separate us from the things that make us distinctive Christians. 
Everybody with me so far? All right. So let's talk about this, okay? Um, that scary dude right there. There is a severing happening with us that involves our ancient ancestry, our revival heritage, and our American principles. So let's, let's start. We'll talk about ancient, in, ancient ancestry first. Y'all ready? Here's Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, it's a matter of great surprise that we're uninstructed in the past doings of our body. Well, Spurgeon said that back in uh, 1879 or whatever. He'd be totally shocked today how separated we are from our own testimony. Leland said that you can trace the Baptists back to 1,500 years before the Reformation. This is the way that Baptist preachers and Baptist historians felt for many, many years. In fact, up until 1899, every Baptist historian believed that Baptists were ancient and that their uh, principles could be traced to the time of Christ. Now, here we are. These are all Baptist people in Europe. Now, they went by different names. They were called different names or whatever. And occasionally there'd be some, some problems with doctrine. Here, they weren't perfect. They're, they're like the Baptists today. I mean, there's a lot of different flavors of us, you know. And some people emphasize this, some people... Anyway, that's, that's who these people are, the Bogomils, the Donatists, the Paulicians, and so forth. Now, I mean, these people really existed. And if they really existed, who in the world were they? Well, the old, the old ancient Baptist, or excuse me, the classic Baptist historians, such as Spittlehouse, Von Braut, and so forth, they all believed that Baptist people were ancient, and, uh, and I'm not talking about secessionism here. I'm talking about the fact that you could find our principles existing in every generation. You know, and I think probably if, you, if we had the archives, we could probably prove secession. But I'm, I don't even want to get into that. The fact is, these old ancient, or excuse me, these classic Baptist historians recognized that these people were our kind of people. All righty. Actually, until 1899, not only Baptists, but even Reformed and Roman Catholic his historians believed the same thing. And, and uh, we don't have time to really get in, into all of that uh, today. But you have to ask your, yourself a question, even if you're just a secular historian. You have to ask yourself, who in the world were these people? Who, who were the Bogomils? Who, you know, who were they? And why did they separate from the Catholic Church? Well, the reason that they did, and I'm going to throw up R.J. Rushdoony here in his book, Christianity in the State, he said, Donatism held that there could be no validity in any church which did not separate itself from the world in Donatist terms. He said, after the 5th century, Donatism as a church ceased to be a consequential problem. Now, what he said really begs the question, what happened to them then? If they only lasted until the 5th century, what happened to them? And our Baptist historian, uh, David Benedict said, or, or he answered what happened here, what he said was, what happened to these people is that the emperor issued an edict and forcible measures were made to bring the Donatists back into the church. You see, the Donatists were the first independent Baptists. They, they said, you know, we, we, we know there's a hierarchy forming here, but we don't want to be a part of it. We want to choose our own pastors on our own. We don't want to come underneath your hierarchy. And so the Catholic Church, which was forming, said, no, no, you can't be independent. You have to join forces with us. And when they refused... The militia was called on them. Uh, and Benedict said there was a, a, an effusion of blood that followed starting in the year three, uh, 347. And for the first time, people who called themselves Christian were actually falling upon other so-called Christians with the edge of the sword, thereby um, uh, 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 completing the prophecy that Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said? He said, there's going to come a day when people will kill you and say they do God's service. And that's exactly what happened. So, in the ancient church now, there was no hierarchy, no central control, no dominion over the state. No church-state relationship at all. And the Donatist problem caused the Catholic Church to form. The Catholic Church formed because they were afraid or, or they wanted to keep this group of independent churches underneath their wing. And so, they needed a theologian to express the ideas of keeping... The church is under control. And that theologian that emerged was Augustine. Augustine. Now, Augustine put together a theological system that works just like this. Now, I'm an ex-Roman Catholic. Any of you folks ever been underneath the, the control of Rome? You understand a little bit about this. But Augustine's world system was, was based on 
on some, uh, some different ideas. First, of course, his original sin. Secondly, his system depended upon infant baptism. Thirdly, sacerdotal salvation. You all following this? A corrupt form of predestination. Now, I believe in predestination. The Bible says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I don't have time to get into all that, but they believe that, uh, or Augustine believed, that certain persons were, were born specifically uh, to have eternal life and others were born specifically to be damned to hell, which, of course, takes away the necessity of the new birth. And so he corrupted that, that early system of what uh, the evangelicals have always called experimental religion. And then covenant theology, theocracy, and ah, millennialism. In other words, uh, uh, Augustine believed that the church was going to dominate the world and take over the world and so forth. So there was no need for Christ to return because Jesus was present in the church. And so therefore, there was no literal return of Christ. They did not believe that. And because they didn't believe that, uh, the first uh, six chapters of the book of Revelation is all figurative. It's not literal. Now, that's, that was started by our friend Augustine. Maybe he's your friend, he's not mine. But anyways... And then capital punishment upon heretics. Now, this was part of what became the old world order. There, there were the Paulicians, not less than 100,000 people were martyred by Catholic troops uh, trying to bring them back under the Roman Catholic rule. The Catholic Church viewed itself as the Israel of the Old Testament. Infant baptism was the sign and seal of the New Covenant. And the New Covenant was a continuation of the Old Covenant with a new administration, the church. Now, I know it's getting deep in here, okay? Now, I want to stop for just a minute and make sure everybody understands this. Any questions about this? Wow, I must be doing a great job. All right. I, look, look, look. The Catholic Church, they thought they were Israel. They, they looked at the Old Testament scriptures, and uh, they believed in, in, uh, in theocracy, the church and the state being married. All right, so here is an old world order that was put in place literally by Augustine and his followers. And the Augustinian worldview is original sin, infant baptism, all of those things involved in the Augustinian worldview. All right, so through the centuries, those dissenters, uh, Baptists for the most part, were systematically condemned as heretics for rejecting infant baptism and refusing the control of the Catholic Church. That's what happened. All right, and, and here's some of the groups that suffered. You can read them for yourself. Read them and weep. Amen? Our young people need to know about those people. Now, after the year 400 or so, the Catholic Church, through the years, began to even uh, disintegrate more and more through the years. And in a lot of circles, the Catholic Church dropped their August, some of their Augustinian beliefs, and they embraced a lot of Thomas Aquinas. In their beliefs, they became more and more... Uh, aberrant. They put a pope at their head. The hierarchy got tighter and tighter and so forth. And uh, the time came for a glorious reformation. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of the people that have been butchered and banished and drowned and burnt and so forth, they're finally going to get a break. Amen. And the first one on the scene was Luther. Martin Luther. A great man in many, many ways. However, Luther said this about us. He said, the Anabaptists are not only blasphemous, but also seditious men. Let the sword exercise its rights over them. No reprieve there. Secondly, Calvin came on the scene. Remember, he ruled from Geneva and so forth. And here's what Calvin said. Calvin said that Augustine wrote against the Donatist and proved that godly princes may lawfully issue edicts for compelling obstinate and rebellious persons to worship the true God. Now, who are those obstinate and rebellious persons? People like Brother Hammett. <laughs> Do you understand that philosophy? Now, you, you've got to understand that philosophy. This is why I'm not a Calvinist Baptist. I'll never be one. All right? And if you are one, you need to rethink some things. How in the world can you, as a Baptist preacher, how can you go along with somebody that, thought, that thinks it's okay to compel people Compel people. Where in the world does the Holy Ghost come in if you, if you have to compel people to live a certain way? A Baptist people have always believed in soul liberty. It is in diametric opposition to the philosophies of John Calvin. All right. So 
Here we see Zurich, all right? We see, uh, this is a picture from the archives, the Zurich City Archives. This is a picture of the reformers in the boat. They have two Anabaptists on the platform, and they pull those men off the platform, drowning them in the river. This was a common practice, especially in the city of, Ur of Zurich. We're not talking about Catholics here. We're talking about the reformed Killing and, uh, and, uh, and drowning Baptist people because they would not submit to their hierarchy and their power. So the old world order stayed in power using the Calvinistic worldview. It stayed in power. Original sin, Calvin differed a little bit with Augustine. He said that uh, sacraments are a means to grace in the church. Which, by the way, is such a schizophrenic uh, type of a idea that the Presbyterians to this day apostatize very quickly because they get that confused with baptismal regeneration. If it's true that baptism is a means to grace, what in the world does that mean? Well, for some people it means you have to be baptized in order to be saved. However, however other Presbyterians do get it right. But it's a very confusing thing to, to embrace John Calvin on these ideas. If amillennialism or postmillennialism is true, then the Bible's not literally true. Jesus' return is not imminent. The events of the book of Revelation took place sometime between the first and the fourth centuries. They call that preterism. And the beast, or the Antichrist, is not a person. Amen? You all follow me here? If it's true that amillennialism is not true, amillennialism, and postmillennialism is true, then the church is Israel. That means that those people that are over in Israel right now, they're not Israel. There's some kind of Zionist state. You understand that? Okay, all right. And if you're working towards a one world theocracy, then you're inadvertently working for Antichrist. All right. Here's how the old world order stayed in power. This is Lorraine Bettner. And Lorraine who is one of the most respected authors in the Reformed movement uh, of the last generation, he wrote in the book, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, that the Reformation was essentially a revival of Augustinianism. Well, of course it was. All it was was taking Augustine's ideas about theocracy and the control of human beings uh, to its absurdity and so forth. Now, again, who in the world, were, who were these people? And uh, did anybody remember who they are? Well, well, if you remember those people, there were a group of historians that remembered those people, okay? But something happened. Now, all the way up to the turn of the 20th century, Baptist historians, going back to 16-something, believed that Baptist people were ancient. But something happened uh, right at the turn of the century that involved a man named William Whitsitt. Now, I mean, I, it would take me all day to, to try to explain what happened with Whitsitt. I'll just say this about him. He was president of the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, and he believed that the Baptists came from the, the English separatists and hadn't immersed until 1641. Now, he was fired because of that. But even though he was fired, his ideas became orthodoxy in the Southern Baptist Convention. To this day, the official stance of the Southern Baptist Convention is that Baptist people came out of, simply came out of the Reformation. That's their official stance. The independent Baptists don't know what their stance is. That's part of the reason why we're doing this. Amen? Okay. All right, all righty, all right. See, the classic historians, along with Leland, Ford, Everts, and Spurgeon, knew the Baptists were ancient. Now, why did they know, or how did they know that the Baptists were ancient? Because of Scripture and because of evidence. Okay? Again, the Bible says in Ephesians 3 that Jesus said uh, that, there, that he would have glory in the church throughout all ages. Now, doesn't that tell you that the church is going to be exi in existence throughout all ages? <clears throat> you know, if you don't believe the right way about this, the Mormons got you. Because they'll come and say, well, the church, you know, how bad it got. And we're a restoration movement. You know, if we don't believe right about this, the Christian church has it. I'm talking about the Campbellites. They have us. Right? Because if, and by the way, and if they're right, they're denying what Christ said right here. He said that the church was going to exist throughout all the ages. I think that's pretty scientific. Jesus said it. All right. Matthew 23, 34, Jesus said, I'll send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. 
Well, if he said he was going to send them, don't we have enough sense to look back through history and figure out who they were? Hello. I start getting really riled up right here, so please forgive me. We know Baptists are ancient because of the wanted posters. Okay, look, here's Dillinger. Now, if you found that poster of, of John Dillinger, you might think, well, you know, maybe he didn't really exist. You know, or at least he wasn't as bad as everybody said. Well, here's our wanted posters. Here's all the edicts that condemned us and called it, whenever we would practice believer's baptism, they called it rebaptism. That's why we were nicknamed Anabaptists. But there wasn't a rebaptism at all. A baptism that is not upon a profession of faith is no baptism. All right, so when we would baptize, they call us, and so they condemned rebaptism. Here's just a small list of them. I don't even include all of them. Here's another portion of that, of that list. These are the wanted posters that prove scientifically, if you want to call it that, scientifically that Baptist people existed throughout all the ages. And so modern Baptist historians, and here's a list of them. Henry, if your favorite one's up there, please forgive me. But Henry Vetter, Baker, Macbeth, and so forth, these are modern Baptist historians that do not believe we have a connection to the Anabaptists. Now, they, they might say, well, maybe we were close and so forth. They just believe that Baptist people came out of the Reformation. That's what they believe, because they embraced the theories of Whitsitt. So, Whitsitt became the accepted, his ideas became the accepted version of Baptist history in the 20th century. So, Whitsittism insisted that the Baptists didn't exist until the Reformation. It was the axe blow that severed ties with the ancient Baptists to this day. That's the end of the first part. So, Anybody have any questions about what we just looked at? Anybody? A question? Yes, sir. That's why the Yara up there, when you said that the Catholic Church thought that they were the Israel. Yes. Do they still believe that today or not? Yes, they do. That's the official stance of the Catholic Church. So therefore, they have the right to rule in a theocracy over the entire world. Okay, see, the Israel ruled in a theocracy by special permission of God the Father. And when they went somewhere, that's why they were given permission to go in and wipe out towns and so forth, because God gave them that special permission. But God never gave the New Testament church that, that, uh, that permission. In fact, Jesus told the disciples, because one of the disciples said, look, the Samaritans aren't believing, let's fall upon them. And the Lord said, you don't even know what spirit you're, you're of. You don't understand what you, because he knew that one day that spirit would uh, involve a lot of terrible destruction throughout the world. Yes, sir, you had a question? What was it that caused Whitsitt's view to gain such ground then? He had, a, as far as I can ascertain, okay, he had a group of young men that he convinced that this was correct. And when he was fired, those young men took his theory and made it correct. In other words, they rallied around his ideas. They even tried to make him look like a martyr for being fired. And so the very next group of men that came into uh, positions of authority in the Southern Baptist Convention just said Whitsitt was right. And there was nobody strong enough. Well, there was a group of people that did oppose them. They nicknamed them the Landmarkers. And they eventually pulled out of the Southern Baptist Convention and formed their own, their own group. But they nicknamed them landmarkers and they tried to uh, smudge their character and everything else. It was really terrible, terrible in, in point in history. But that's how it happened. Yes? Is that also where the Baptist writers come in? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Baptist writers. Baptist writers. Yeah, and, and it's a knee-jerk reaction. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know that much about Baptist writers. I have more respect for landmark people because they read and they at least try to prove their point than I have for Baptists that never read and don't know what they are. So, all right, can we go on? You ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's look at the second severance, okay? We have been severed from our revival heritage, okay? We're severed from it. Samuel Harris, one of the greatest men of God this country has ever produced, birthed something like 50 churches in the state of Virginia. His work resulted in Virginia being transformed from an Anglican colony to a colony where the Baptists were in the majority. But how many people have heard of Samuel Harris? Samuel Harris is responsible for Washington, Madison, 
and Patrick Henry to pay attention to those Baptists that were imprisoned in Virginia for those men to realize the tyranny that was taking place in a government that they were wanting to defend and they realized how hypocritical that was uh, to proclaim liberty and yet not allow a group of Christian people to exercise their, their rights as citizens of this emerging country. We ought to know about that sort of thing. We've been severed from it. Bible-believing Baptists have a dual heritage. We have a fundamental and a Baptist heritage. Our fundamental heritage reaches back just over 100 years to the time of the citywide revivals under these famous evangelists that we quote all the time. But our Baptist heritage reaches further back to the ancient Baptists of Europe and to the American wilderness to the separate Baptist revival. Now, when, in, mo in most schools, uh, Brother Hammett, uh, if they talk about the great revivals of the past, they'll mention the Great Awakening with Whitfield and so forth. And uh, sometimes they'll mention this great revival in Kentucky. And, uh, of course, they'll mention the era of Finney and Hammond and Moody and Jones and Smith and so forth. And then, if the student's lucky, he'll get a little bit of information on the Fulton Street Prayer Revival, which was a great revival. But what's missing from our curriculum and from our pulpits is... By the way, that's the one we talk about the most. But the revivals that are missing that we don't talk about, there are three Baptist revivals. I, the first one is the separate Baptist revival. And then the great Baptist revival of Virginia under Samuel Harris that I just mentioned a minute ago. And then the independent Baptist Sunday school revival, which I think was something that saved the country years ago when churches were birthed all over, all over the country. Um, it's strange that this revival, which really is still going on to this day, is never, is never mentioned. It's been hidden uh, from, our, from our awareness. Uh, and the model that it gives is hidden. Shubal Starnes, Daniel Marshall, Samuel Harris, Abraham Marshall, Isaac McCoy, do those names mean anything to you? I want to tell you something. They meant, those names meant something to America in the 19th century. These were famous men uh, whom even secular historians mention in their history books. And the result, if you knew of a, of a man that birthed a thousand churches, wouldn't you want to learn from him? Amen. I sure would have liked to have learned from him when I was in... But here he is, Shubal Starnes. It's not really him, it's a drawing of him. But this is a, de a depiction of Shubal. And uh, Brother Faggart will tell you a little bit more about this painting. This be has become a painting, a beautiful painting. This is 17 people that came from Connecticut and, uh, and went to North Carolina. And I told you a little bit about the story. The result in two generations was 5,000 churches. Incredible. Um, Starnes and his followers went all over the place. They up and down the states, here, there, everywhere. Amen. They would rush out in front of the population and start churches. And the first few people that would come into an area and, uh, and they would birth churches ahead of the crowd as the crowd went across the United States and population in the United States. Now, this is a group of Baptist evangelists that, that were birthed in the wake of that revival. And these are the men that we should know about. James Smith Coleman baptized 5,000 people in the state of uh, Kentucky alone. Abraham Marshall who preached to as great a crowds as Whitfield, and yet we've never heard about him. At the end of his campaigns, he would instruct people on baptism. Brother Fagger's going to tell you a little story about what uh, Abraham Marshall used to do with uh, these crowds of people that would hear him. They'd get born again, and he would baptize his converts at the end of a revival meeting. These are the citywide Baptist revival, uh, revivalists that came on the scene. And then there's a whole group of, of, of other preachers that were on the scene a little bit after that and at the same time. And these are the ones we know about. Okay, I mean, we should know about all these guys. But these are the ones we know about. What is up with that? Again, these are the revivals. Here's what G.W. Pascal said. He was a professor at Wake Forest. He said, I make bold to state that the separate Baptists have proved to be the most remarkable body of Christians America has known. Well, no, it is past tense. America has known them. They don't know them anymore. So what happened? We should know about Isaac McCoy. 
We should know about Star and Suspension. We should know about Jeremiah Vardaman. We should know about these wonderful men, and yet we don't know very much about them. Here's who we know about. We know all about Charles Finney. How many times have we heard him talked about? We know a little bit about E.P. Hammond. We know a lot about Moody, a lot about Sam Jones, Gypsy Smith, J. Wilbur Chapman, Billy Sunday. All good men, but none of them, none of them Baptist. Not, well, why? Why? All right, I'm going to try to explain it. This, this is Henry Ward Beecher. Henry Ward Beecher said, uh, Beecher was, of course, a congregational preacher from Boston. He said, just before the Civil War, he said that a great evangelical assimilation is coming to the United States. Now, this great evangelical assimilation uh, was promoted by two organizations. Now, if you want to write this down, this, is, this gets a little academic here, but these two organizations were the Christian Union and the Evangelical Alliance. Now, these old-time preachers, such as Moody and Jones, they, greatly, they were greatly benefited by the Evangelical Alliance. But Baptist participation in these things was pretty small. Now, now some Baptists did participate, but most of them did not. And they respectfully declined. Now, they didn't criticize Moody. They didn't, they, they weren't, of course, they weren't against people getting saved. They were glad about that. But they were not glad about the compromise concerning baptism. It only been one generation uh, that their forefathers had been imprisoned over that entire thing. And so uh, they respectfully declined in, in many, many cases. Now, what happened was, most of you are aware of, the, that German rationalism came on the scene and it invaded the Protestant and Baptist colleges of America. Now, because of that German rationalism, that rationalism gave birth to the modernist movement. This is, was a tremendous amount of unbelief that came into the colleges of our country. This threatened the purity of the evangelical alliance. So as a result of that, fundamentalism arose to rescue the evangelical alliance from unbelief. Now, was that a bad thing? No, of course it wasn't a bad thing. Fundamentalism, was, it came on the scene uh, to try to keep the Methodists from going completely out of their minds. Okay, It came on the scene to try to uh, keep Baptist people and every Bible-believing church in the country. It was on the scene to try uh, to prevent this terrible uh, 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 backslidden condition the churches and the colleges were getting into. See, But I got to tell you, you know, I, I, I shared this briefing with, with Shelton Smith. I sat with him for an hour. And I said, Brother Smith, isn't it true that fundamentalism became basically a Baptist movement? And he said, yeah, you're right. I said, so really, if this is a Baptist, shouldn't we know more about Baptist people then begin to understand who we are and where we came from? And, and he agreed with me. Now, the, the truth is, brother, I, I, don't, I don't know if you ever have a Methodist in your pulpit. I don't. Yeah. I don't have a Presbyterian in my pulpit yeah. anymore. Uh, I can't. I can't because it's too confusing to our people now. Right. Our people suffer for, for these distinctives that we have. Mm -hmm. I had a Southern Baptist preacher call me one time and he said, how come you independents never come over here with us and fellowship with us? I said, well, you guys don't suffer like we suffer the same way. We don't suffer the same way. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, when is the last time you lost somebody because you preached on rock music? Mm -hmm. When's the last time your ladies were embarrassed at the mall because they were dressed modestly? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they felt out of place? I said, there's not a lot of difference, but don't you understand that? that that's suffering. And by the way, this is, this is, listen, the Methodists did not suffer like our people suffered. Right. The Presbyterians never suffered the way. Now, I do know that there were certain times when, uh, when the Catholic Church uh, uh, was out to destroy the Reformers as well as the Baptists, but that heritage, there never was a fellowship of suffering. That's right. That's right. See, so when fundamentalism arose, it was a good thing, but... Uh, what fundamentalism did is it formed schools, right? Because you couldn't send your preachers. And so Baptist people would send uh, their, their young people to some of these schools right here. Okay? Um, Moody Bible Institute, Wheaton College, Bob Jones, Fuller, Biola. Even Tennessee Temple in the beginning was supposedly an ecumenical school. Um, Pensacola Christian and so forth. Now, folks, don't lose me here. I'm not trying to criticize. This is the way it was. This is what happened. I'm not telling you, try to, and I'm, 
I'm not mad at any of these schools. I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just telling you, this is the, why they were formed. Okay? And they weren't formed for bad reasons at all. But what happened was, when they were formed, they were formed underneath the idea of the points of fundamentalism. Now, fundamentalists adhere to the five fundamentals outlined by the 1910 General Assembly of the Northern Presbyterian Church. And these five fundamentals are, and you've, you've probably preached these before, I have, um, the inerrancy of the Word of God, virgin birth of Christ, salvation by grace through faith, bodily resurrection, second coming of Christ. Th those are the five fundamentals. I, I, I heard Curtis Hudson preach this very message many times. Now, is this a bad document? No, of course not. It's not a bad document. However, Baptist churches sent their preachers to be trained at institutions that gave them the evangelical alliance and fundamentalism as their primary heritage. So if, you, if you're going to give the evangelical alliance, that's why we know all about Moody. That's because he was from the evangelical alliance. And this continued for 75 years, my friends. So for 70, at least 75 years, very little Baptist heritage was heard in the pulpits. Very little. And... Our fundamental heritage overtook our Baptist heritage. And this is why we don't know what we ought to know about our own heritage. Uh, did somebody do that on purpose? I think it was a pretty bad accident. You know, the devil did it on purpose, but it's unfortunate that that happened. Now, I want to illustrate this by the formation. This is illustrated by this. This has happened six or eight months ago. The formation of the International Baptist Network. This is a brand new Baptist denomination. It comes on the scene, right? And the leader of this new organization said, the IBN is possible because the SBC has dealt with its liberal left and the independent Baptists have dealt with its radical right. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> All right. But listen to this. Listen to this. The fellow says, our denominational labels are not doctrine. Well, may I ask you something? If they're not doctrine, what are they? They better be doctrine. He says this meaning is not about denominational labels. This meaning is about the fundamentals of the faith. Okay, now what are the fundamentals of the faith? He tells us what the, he says, well, here they are. Uh, the, the word of God, the, uh, Jesus born of a virgin, the, you know, the son of God and so forth. This is exactly, this is the, the five, this is the five fundamentals outlined by the 1910 General Assembly of the Northern Presbyterian Church. And this illustrates how we continue every generation to be severed from our Baptist heritage because we keep repeating our fundamental heritage. Yeah. Yeah. I want to point out to you that believers' immersion, liberty of conscience, and the imminent return of Christ are fundamental to our faith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Elevating fundamental heritage was the axe blow that severed the roots of our Baptist revival heritage. That's why we don't know about our own heritage because of that. All right. Anybody got any questions about this now? I'll come down here and field a question or two. Anybody? Yes, sir. You said the Evangelical Alliance and the Christian Union. Yes, sir. Do you go into the Christian Union in your book? or what's, uh, They're not one and the same? Are you they're, saying that they're different? They are different. The, the uh, Christian Union died out during the Civil War, and the Evangelical Alliance was sort of a revival of that. One of the reasons that the, the old Christian Union died out is because it was answered by Thomas Armitage. They were trying to get the Baptists to participate in this, and Armitage went to one of their meetings. They invited him to speak. Now, can you imagine the courage that this took? Armitage gets up in front of all of these reformed and, and whatever, and he says, hey, folks, if we unite with you on, on our communion, it'll violate our scriptures uh, or our principles, and it'll violate your principles, so we're not going to do it. <laughs> and really, after that meeting, the old union died out as a result of Armitage's courage. But after the war, people were a little bit more tired of fighting over things, and and Baptist people didn't protest as much. Although, if you go down to Wake Forest Library, go into their archives, you'll see article after article after article of Baptist preachers all over the country saying, we really don't need to be in this union movement. We don't need to be a part of this. And it damages our heritage. It's amazing how many people opposed it. But you, you don't ever read about that. Any other questions? A good question. Any other questions? 
If not, we're going to go to the next part. All right, here we go. I want to get that ugly box off of there. He bothers me. All right. How about our third severance here? Our American principles. All right. Here's George W. Truett. Truett, the old Southern Baptist preacher, he said, we need to go back to the days of Washington and Jefferson and Madison. And back to the days of our Baptist fathers who paid such a great price. What in the world is he talking about? All right. The axe blow that severed the Baptists from their American principles was the Christian school movement. It still is. To understand the stunning truth, we need to know what American principles are and from whence they came. So, we're going to give you a brief and true history of American liberty. Ready? Here we go. Breaking the old world order. Do you realize that's what the American Republic did? We broke the old world order. Nobody is going to make you baptize your child into any church in this country. Nobody's going to make you believe what you're supposed to believe under a theocracy in this country. And we better pay attention to these principles again. Because we got a whole group of, of people on the, on, the, on the Christian right. Now, don't throw stones yet. But on the Christian right that are actually advocating a return to theocracy. And you better pay attention to what they're saying. Amen? Y'all with me here? Hey. American liberty was purchased... And it was started, American Liberty started really with Wycliffe. It actually started before Wycliffe. It's just that we don't have any of the writings of the old Baptist dissonance. They were burned with them. So we don't have them. The earliest one we have was by Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a Lollard, and the Lollards were Baptist people. They rejected infant baptism. They believed in, in believer's immersion. And so Wycliffe wrote against church-state theocracy. And Leonard Busher wrote in 1614 against it. Here's what Busher said. Well, by the way, here's Edward Whiteman, burned in 1611. He was part of the old world order, the last of the Baptists to be, born in, uh, to be burned there. Here's what Busher said in 1641. Look at what he says. He says to the king of England, he says, Suffer not your bishops to destroy those men and women that strive to serve God according to his word. First of all, he is recognizing the fact that the king has his bishops. And he says, don't, don't destroy those Baptist people because of your bishops. They, they want to do that. He was pleading for his own liberty and other men. And he's saying, he's saying when you burn and banish them and you're doing things to peaceable Christians and you ought to give them their liberty. Well, Busher didn't get his liberty. He was burned and died there in England. But after him, a man who we don't know his name, an anonymous prisoner, in Newgate, he pled for his own liberty, and he said, it's not in your power to compel the heart. He said that to the king. He said, king, you can't make anybody believe anything. He said, if you try to do that, you're going to create hypocrites. My wife and I were in England last, last year, and we found the old Newgate prison. It's underneath a bar. We went, went in through that bar and handed out tracks and went to the basement. And we took pictures of the inside of that, and, and, and it's an amazing thing. This is where this man suffered. Now, he, di he died in prison. We don't even know who he was, but somebody found out who he was, and that was Roger Williams. Williams, when he wrote his book, The Bloody Tenant, and that thing hit, and by the way, thank God for printing, because now Baptists are getting some of their information out. And so in 1644, Williams, in defense of the anonymous prisoner wrote his book, The Bloody Tenet, and it's amazing that he wasn't killed. I mean, he, there were plenty of people that were calling for his death, but he was in another place, a wonderful place called America. Okay? And, and believe me, the Puritans hated him as well and wanted him dead, but he escaped. Okay? And, and so he wrote this wonderful defense. This document is so important in American history. It is amazing to me that public school kids don't know about this, but it's more amazing that Christian school kids don't know anything about this document. And, and I'm going to show you why, how amazing it is that we don't know. 
Here's the old world order. This is Boston, 1651. This is the beating of Obadiah Holmes. Look at the two Puritans there uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, they're holding something in their hand. What are they holding? They are holding an order to beat this Baptist preacher because he was holding an unauthorized church service in Boston. And you'll never find in the history of the New Testament church a Baptist holding such an obnoxious order. That's the old world order. Now, here's what William said. He took that, that, and that, that treatise from the anonymous prisoner and he wrote the bloody tenant. And here's what he said in the bloody tenant. He said, a people may erect and establish what form of government seems to them the most meet. Down here he says that governments have no more power than the civil power of people consenting and agreeing shall be trusted them with. That's pretty revolutionary ideas. You say, that sounds familiar. It sure does. Here's Thomas Jefferson in 1776. That to ensure these rights, by the way, this is called the Declaration of Independence. Go home and read this, all right? To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That sounds just like Williams. You say, oh, preacher, come on. All right, you don't want to believe me? Maybe you think it's John Locke. Maybe you think that all those ideas came from Locke. If you know a little bit about political history, John Locke said many of those same things. You say, well, he got, uh, Jefferson got his ideas from Locke. Well, here's David Little, Harvard University professor. David Little says Locke's ideas are simply restatements of the central arguments in favor of freedom of conscience developed by Williams in the middle of the 17th century. I'm going with Little on this one. All right. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what Williams and John Clark did, and John Clark was, was a greater leader than Williams actually in the, in the forming, of course, of the First Baptist Church in America, but also the state of Rhode Island. On the side of the building, maybe you've been in Providence to see this, the facade of the building giving this, this, this wonderful accolade to, uh, uh, to, uh, to John Clark. And, and what did the United States think of Rhode Island? What was their opinion? What did Rhode Island mean to the world? George Bancroft, very famous historian from the 19th century, he said the principles which Williams soon, uh, uh, the, princ the principles which Williams soon found occasion to publish to the world became the basis of the religious freedom of mankind. This is George Bancroft. Here is Senator Henry Anthony. This statue uh, dedicated to Williams, I wish they'd have put a statue to Clark, but... At least they did honor Williams. This, this uh, statue is in the Capitol Rotunda. And Anthony gave this speech. He said, he said, Williams didn't merely lay the foundation of religious freedom. He constructed the whole edifice. Religious freedom, which now, by general consent, underlies the foundation principles of civilized government. That's breaking the old world order. That's what our nation did. Okay, We broke the old world order. All right? Uh, Alonzo Williams said Williams' banishment became a pivotal act of universal history. Judge Story, whom David Barton loves to quote, said in Clark and Williams, we read for the first time that the declaration that the conscience should be free. What is that? It's breaking the old world order. All right. So American principles are essentially Baptist principles. Baptist principles have impressed themselves upon the nation as the only principles consistent with civil and religious liberty. That's a quote by John Quincy Adams, J.Q. Adams, who was a Baptist theologian. He wasn't the only one that believed that. American principles are basically Baptist principles. That's an, that's out, that, I'll tell you what, that's outrageous. No, it's not. If you don't believe me, how about... If you don't believe me that American principles are Baptist principles, how about David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Great Britain? He faced the German army during World War I, and he understood the oppression and tyranny of the old world, uh, of the old world order. Here's what George said. He sent this message to the American National Baptist Convention in 1918. He said, it's Baptist principles that we're fighting for in this great struggle. All that Baptists count dear is at stake in this issue. Now, he's not the only one. I did a research on, on uh, Judge Story did research on, 
on uh, Bancroft and, and uh, Eggleston and other 19th century historians, and they all give our forefathers credit for establishing this form of government. Man, it's a blessing, isn't it? It really, really is a wonderful thing. However, not everybody was impressed. <laughs> Here's Samuel Rutherford. He's the Presbyterian divine. Why do they get to be divines and we don't get to be a divine? I don't know. But anyway, this Presbyterian divine wrote against Williams. Here's his book, A Free Disputation Against Pretended Liberty of Conscience. You know why I believe that? He had a corrupt form of predestination running his life. Okay. Rutherford wasn't impressed, but could you please explain to me why the Rutherford Institute is named for him? I don't understand that. I'd like to have a letter on that from somebody. All right. So Rutherford called for William's execution. He didn't get his wish. He called for it. Remember our four disturbing facts? Remember this? Baptist Christians don't know their own heritage, remember? Baptists are starting to embrace somebody else's worldview. The Baptist educational system has been reconstructed. And Baptists have forfeited the place of leader. Remember those things? All right. Baptist Christians in this country have an enemy. Okay? And that enemy is the Catholic Reformed Reconstructionist. Now, why is there so much animosity? Okay? There's, there's an axe to grind here. Why is there so much animosity with these people? Well, this might explain it. This is our first president being baptized by a Baptist preacher in the Potomac. This is, this is John Gano. This portrait is hanging in the uh, lobby of the Gano Chapel at William Jewell College in the state of Missouri, in Liberty, Missouri. And uh, the Baptist Christians of America broke the yoke of the Catholic Reformed Old World Order. We, we broke that. Uh, we were in Rhode Island on the, on the history tour, and one of the tour guides in Providence Someone asked him about Gano baptizing Washington, and the tour guide laughed. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's an old wives' tale. It didn't happen. And it bothered me so much that uh, I went on a, on a goose chase looking for any documentation on this event. I went to Rochester, New York with my wife. We went into the archives there because uh, their index said that they had a box of material on John Gano. Just went there to see if they had anything. The man brought out a box. We went through it, didn't find any of the, of the evidence because supposedly there were signed affidavits from Gano's family saying that he had said this. Yes, I did baptize Washington. And so we didn't, we didn't find that. So finally I said, is there anything back there at all? And so we, we went back there and in the corner there was a box and a bunch of stuff. And underneath a bunch of stuff and boxes, there was another box that said Gano. So our, our buddy took the box out, set it on the desk, and inside that box, 270 some odd pages of documented evidence of Gano baptizing Washington, including all of those signed affidavits. Now, we made that public uh, with In America in Crimson Red, and this is something that the family has said for years. Why would Washington do that? I'll tell you why he did it. To break the baptism of Europe. That's why he did it, and he understood exactly what he was doing when you look at all of the evidence. Now, our enemies, how serious are these people? Well, they're serious enough to rewrite history. Okay, how serious are they? They're serious enough to attempt to change the way Americans look at their own government, and they're serious enough to reconstruct the Baptist educational system and write our own heritage out of that system. The, the leader of this movement is R.J. Rushdoony. He was a student of Princeton professor Cornelius Van Til, and Rushdoony took Van Til's covenant Presbyterian ideas to, really, to the fringe, and he became a true Augustinian theologian. Remember we talked about these men, when you boil them down, really what you get is Augustine. You get Augustine's philosophies and so forth. Remember we said that? Well, Rush Dooney got... <laughs> I'm sorry I did that. I just couldn't resist. But, um, Mr. Rush Dooney is no longer with us. He's passed away. He's in heaven, I hope. Right? Okay, but he, he flexed his Augustinian Calvinist muscles. He gathered a group of writers and theologians, and he literally ambushed the sleeping Baptists of this country. We've been sleeping for a long time. Well, really, we've been really busy. We've been trying to save the country by going soul winning and birthing or starting churches and so forth. We've been very busy, and this enemy has been writing against us for years. And not only have they been writing against us, They've been writing textbooks that they've been putting into our children's hands. Um, 
Here are the three, theolo uh, three theological books that were written about 25 years ago. Brother Hammett, they've never been answered. And they really ought to be answered. These three books, The Failure of American Baptist Culture. I'm telling you, I, I, I like to find books. It is almost impossible to find this book. Because after it was written and they, all their gurus got their information, they flushed all these somewhere. It is almost impossible to find it. This theology book, and anyway, this gives their philosophy of what they do, what they believed. And they told us what they believed years ago. Rush Dooney, these are men that rushed, these are men that, uh, that wrote with Rush Dooney. James Gordon, Pat Robertson, we all know who he is. Gary North, uh, Craig Bulkley, even John Whitehead. Francis Schaeffer, who is very popular among independent Baptists. And uh, Joe Moorcroft and so forth, and they got together to form or to formulate some theology. Now, you say, I don't want to learn theology. Theology is the engine that runs life. And I want to tell you, you already have a theology. You might say you don't have one, but you already have one. It's the thing that rules the way you live. And so they gave a theology. Now, here, I'm going to give you some of the quotes from these, from these books, all right? Ray Sutton said, Baptist history, theology, and sociology are devastating to civilization. Remember what the 19th century said about American Baptist polity? Now, here's a man that says, no, no, that, no that's terrible. It's terrible poly Religious liberty, that's awful. That's terrible. James B. Gordon said, to illustrate the differences between Reformed and Baptistic thinking is the matter of human rights. Is the Catholic and Reformed faith opposed to human rights? Yes! Well, of course they are. If you exercise your right to believe and trust Christ on your own, you, you go to a church that is independent from the other hierarchy, and you're baptized by immersion, you are an enemy of the state. That's what you are. How about this one? Ingram said, in one of these books, the human rights idea has been cried up for an alternative to divine law, law since the Declaration of the Rights of Virginia in 1776. That document, the Declaration of the Rights of Virginia, was written by Jefferson. It is a pivotal doctrine or, or a document in the history of America and really was the basis of the foundation of the Declaration of Independence. And here are these Reformed people. And by the way, Rush Dooney and the rest of those crowd, they never repudiated these ideas. This is what they believe. They're telling us it's a foundation of sand. I, I know, I, I know you're, you're going into overload now, but I'll, I'll do my best. I'm, I'm in overload right now. I know your head's spinning right now, right? Don't worry about it. Jesus is still in control. Now look, Gary Norris said, the citizens of Rhode Island rebelled. And in doing so, they led the world step by step into a political conspiracy against God. This is what the Reformed believe about the foundation of our country. And if you get them to be honest... They'll tell you that's what they believe. Baptist history, theology, and sociology spell failure. The system at root centers around man. For that reason, the American Baptist paradigm will go the way of man. Death. Death. The only problem is how in the world are you going to change this country? You have to change by starting with children. The idea is, Gary North said this way back in 1986, he said, the idea is, of the Reconstructionists have penetrated into Protestant circles that for the most part are unaware of the original, the original source of the theological... Well, I'm making you aware right now. Here is the source of the theological... Here it is! I'll make you aware of it. Listen, the three major legs of the Reconstructionist movement, according to North, are the Presbyterian-oriented educators. Those are the ones that wrote the books while we were making fun of theology. You ever been in a Baptist conference where they make fun of theology? I think we need to stop that. The Baptist school headmasters and pastors, where's your administrator of your school? Who's the administrator of the Christian? That's you, Bob. Looky. Look where you are. You're being used, man. You're being duped. Look at that. And the charismatic telecommunication system, which is Pat Robertson, and that whole crowd. And they're all a part of trying to reconstruct the way people think in this country. So... You know, I don't know who did this. Now, I don't know who did this, but they probably, they either got, they're gone. You, see, you notice whoever did that is not there, no. But 
but if, you know, if I was the, the person that owned that dock, I'd get that guy back and have him clean up that mess while I was driving out of town. But the truth is, we have a mess on our hands. We have a potential here of great damage to our nation and to our movement, if you want to call the Independent Baptist Movement a movement. And it's not going to get solved by sticking your head in the sand and acting like it doesn't exist, which is what we've done for 20-some-odd years in this nation. Now, Christian schools began their rise in America in the late 1950s. And in the beginning, the curriculum was fashioned by the teachers themselves in conservative circles across the country. And during this time, much of the educational philosophy was formulated by men such as Francis Schaeffer and R.J. Rushtuni. This is a fact. This really happened. Now, let's, let's go to 1976 at a very pivotal time and a man by the name of Don Howard. Now, I'm not saying Donald Howard's a bad man. I, I, I don't really know that much about him. All I know is that, uh, is that he's written some different books. And I want to get this book because I want you all to see it so you know I'm telling you the truth here. But in, in 1976, uh, Don Howard wrote... Huh. I think where I was last night, somebody wanted that book pretty bad. Um, in 1976, Don Howard wrote the book, Rebirth of Our Nation. This book went into the hands of Baptist preachers all over the country. And in one year, the accelerated Christian education went from having about 2,000 schools to about 10,000 schools overnight. It was unbelievable what happened. Now, where did Don Howard get his, his educational philosophy? Well, on the back of the book is a picture of R.J. Rushtuni. And Rushtuni, the undisputed leader of the Catholic Reform Reconstruction, endorsed the book, but most importantly, he advised Don Howard uh, and gave him his philosophy. Here, here's what Rushtuni said. He said, a war is on. This is, what, this is on the back of that book. If you're unaware of it, you'll be on the casualty list of God. Man, this war is a humanistic war, blah, 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 all that sort of thing. And here's what... Don Howard says in the book, Rebirth of Our Nation, he says, a new system of schools and a new curriculum based on the theology and philosophy of the reformers is taking root, sprouting and budding in church classrooms across America. So what philosophy does Don, what is his theology? Howard says, a Christian curriculum based upon the biblical theism of the reformers is taking shape. In this book, he quotes Samuel Rutherford. Rutherford wrote a titanic book called Lex Rex. Our American culture was built upon that principle. Was it really? Our American culture was built upon the old world order? Remember Rutherford? He called for William's execution. Remember that? Don't short circuit yet, okay? Hear me out. A Christian curriculum based upon the biblical theism of the reformers is taking place. Is that what was going on in Baptist schools across America? Is that really what was going on? In the inaugural book of the Christian school movement, and, 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 and there was other movements at this time, but I'm talking about that particular movement, no mention of the Baptists or their sufferings to secure liberty is made. Now listen, if Rush Duny and Schaefer, if they wanted to try to create a system of of schools across the country that educated reformed children, I wouldn't be opposed to that. They can do whatever they want to do. But this was marketed to Baptist people. Yes, sir. Because they knew we were getting busy getting people in our churches. We, were, we believed in Christian education. There's no mention of our heritage. To this day, with a few trace exceptions, Christian school curriculum used by Baptist Christian School children and homeschoolers is devoid of Baptist heritage. You know that's true. I could give you some examples. It would take me all day. It doesn't matter which group you take from, Bob Jones, Alpha Omega, Becca. Landmark does have a Baptist history course, but the rest of its history is, 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 is tainted. And hey, Vicki, can you give me a, 
one of those black books. I forgot. Let me, let me go ahead and get one. I'm going to see if I got one right here. And I want to just read a couple of things if I can. All right. For instance, in the Bob Jones curriculum, they say the only mention in their in their history book, they mention the Baptists on page 54. They say Baptists also settled there. I'm sure they did. OK. In their in their heritage, their heritage uh, series here, heritage series two. They say about Roger Williams' banishment, they say he moved away because he did not agree with the other preachers. Okay. A lot of stuff out there. I don't want to overload. You're already overloaded. Uh, it took me four years to come out of the coma. And I'm trying to get you out of the coma in two hours. Please forgive me. But here's Alpha Omega used in a lot of homeschools and so forth. And uh, Alpha Omega... In their civics class, they begin in their civics class, Life Pack 7.8, begins with Augustine and Aquinas, and they're referred to as Christianity's two greatest political thinkers. Uh, on Life Pack 9.1, they tell our ninth graders, the United States is one of the few countries that practices religious tolerance. Did you catch that? You do realize that we don't have tolerance in this country. We have liberty. Yes, and tolerance implies that one religious group will be in the theocracy and everybody else will be tolerated. That's not what we have. And by the way, I don't know if you can see this. In their life pack on the worldview, they say there's only two worldviews. That's a lot of hooey. There's a bunch of worldviews. But here is... Man's worldview, which of course is secular humanism, which, which when you read those theology books, that's what they call Baptists. We're secular humanists. Read it for your, you can get those books and read it for yourself. But this worldview of man is self-centered, and this is the worldview of God, with God in the center, and they find it perfectly all right to use a Mobius in order to symbolize God in their material. There's be some parents should call them about that. I'm not going to call them. You call them. I've made enough phone calls. Um, all right, Becca. Now, to Becca's credit, they, they have uh, listened to men like James Seiler, who's written them letters saying, listen, there's no Baptist heritage in our history books, and they've changed a little bit. Not a lot. But what they do, what they do, do in Becca is they constantly talk about our Puritan heritage. They say that we have a Puritan heritage, the United States. Uh, in the heritage of freedom, they say the Reformation spread throughout Europe, bring a, bringing a revival of biblical Christianity. No, it didn't. It reinforced the old world order. It didn't bring about... Uh, Biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity was done away with by Augustine and continued by Calvin. Again, they repeat our Puritan heritage and so forth. So many things. Again, I'm grateful for Landmark's stance on Baptist heritage and history, but in their other history courses, for instance, in their, in their history and geography, on page 30 they say the Puritans were sometimes hard on the Baptists. I would say beating them and banishing them and hanging them would be a little hard. <laughs> On page 63 of the same book is the same claim that somehow Samuel Rutherford is responsible for the Declaration of Independence. And you check it out. You read. Do you ever read your kids' books? Read their history. Read their civic and, and look their civics and, and understand. Huh? I'm not trying to make you panic here, but... We need to do something about this. ACE, ACE Life Pack 1086, Martin Luther is given credit for the rise of, of America. It says it was primarily because of his discovery of the justification by faith. Well, listen, he didn't discover <laughs> justification by faith. 
But because of him, you know, and then on page 17, we find the Calvinist in the Church of England, which disagree, founded two separate movements, the Puritans and the Separates. And this statement perpetuates the idea that Williams, Clark, and the Baptists were simply Calvinists. And of course, they were not. And so on and so on and so forth and all of that stuff. Now, homeschooling and the homeschool thing is a very difficult thing. Um, J. Rogers wrote that a little known fact is that R.J. Rushdoony, aside from being the founder of Christian Reconstruction, is also the founder of the modern homeschooling movement. Uh, this is not advertised, or if they talk about it, nobody realizes who Rushdoony was. Rushdoony was a guru walking around. Uh, trying to say that he was an expert in education, and we listened to him and believed him. The Homeschool Legal uh, Defense Association has definite ties to the Reconstructionist movement through former employees such as Doug Phillips and the founder, James Carden. They were instrumental in introducing the concept of homeschooling to Bill Gothard. Now, don't throw rocks. I think Bill Gothard is a good man. I really do. I think he's got good character. As far as I know, I think his intentions are good, as far as I know. But his material is absolutely devoid of any Baptist thought or testimony. And so many Baptist homeschool kids are taught using his system. Um, it's an advancement of Rush Dooney's ideas. And according to ATI, the founders of the American Republic were the Catholic Reformed. And there's nothing about Williams. John Clark, Isaac Backus, Leland, or the Baptist, none of those things are mentioned in that material. So, the Christian school and homeschool movement has severed the Baptist roots of American liberty. And our Baptist forefathers have been eliminated from our own curriculum. Okay. Okay. End of part. Any questions about this? And I have one more thing to show you. Any questions about this? I'm not trying to hurt anybody here. And I don't want you to panic either because there's some things that can be done. Yes, sir. Are there some good books written for elementary high school age children that tell stories? Or that's four problems? Is there a curriculum or something that they can teach? There is. I tell you what's available now. Um, this is going to sound like a commercial, okay, but, but I have a book on Baptist history that is used in our own high school with our kids. It's the Baptist History Workbook. It's actually a collegiate level course, and that's being used in, I think, 18 colleges now. But that course is suitable for high schoolers. They can read it. They can. Our kids do it. Your kids could do it. But what we're working on is something on the high school level that will be appropriate not only for uh, a uh, traditional setting, but also for homeschool and for folks that are using ACE-style workbooks. And that will be available this fall. If you want to get something right away, you can get that workbook. And that thing is wonderful. I will t I'm not tooting my horn here, but the reason why I think it's wonderful is because I take all the classic Baptist historians and I use their stuff. And I just put it in there for you to read. So it's not my opinion. It's what the old timers said. And uh, it's really good stuff. It really is. And I have a friend of mine uh, by the name of Jerry Ross who is helping write Bible curriculum for Christian schools. And he and I are working on history and Bible curriculum so that our testimony won't be omitted. Anybody else? You all still with me? We've been here for a while. But I got one more thing to show you, all right? Listen, you young people, you're really doing... Wonderful. You, you, you got some good kids here. I appreciate you being attentive. It really, it really means a lot. And, and this will mean more to you a little bit later. It might mean something to you now. Who knows? But here's our, here's our epilogue. The American public is in the throes of being reconstructed about our history. Listen, the liberal historians distorted American history for about 100 years. From, from about the year 1900 till about 20 years ago, all you could read was liberal historians. You'd have to go back to the 19th century with Judge Story and others and, and uh, Bancroft and Eagleston and men like that to read, and Andrews, to read good American history that gives a full rounded view 
and also includes our Baptist heritage in it. But since that time, liberal historians have rewritten history. We know that. But starting with this book right here, The Light and the Glory, written by Peter Marshall and David Manuel, very popular book. Uh, this was the first book out that actually tried to get Americans to understand we had a Christian heritage. Okay, it's the first one. The basis of this book are two Reformed books, one by McFetridge and the other by Bettner. And these, these two books make a very bold claim. Who founded America? According to these men, John Calvin. John Calvin founded America. Now, that is the basis of this, this history. Those two histories are the basis of this history. And this history is the basis of a lot of other histories. The light and the glory. Um, here's what Marshall and Manuel said about Williams. They said, Williams is tragic, self-righteous, impossible, arrogant, judgmental. I don't know who's judging who here. Judgmental. To know him was to like him, no matter how impossible the tenets he insisted upon. And they were impossible. Let me get this straight. Baptist principles, which basically are American principles, are impossible. Impossible. You know, he, he went from one untenable position after another. He's just an impossible guy. Here's what these guys say about liberty of conscience. Nobody's going to tell me what I should do or believe. That's what they think we believe about liberty. That's not what we believe about liberty. Taken to its extremes, it becomes a license to disregard all authority with which we do not happen to agree with at the time. Do you mean the authority that comes and says, you better bring your child to infant baptism or we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tie you to a stake and whoop you? Is that what they mean? You know what? It is what they mean. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, you're not fooling me, buddy. I know about this history, man. I've been reading. You, in Baptist preachers, you ought to go back to your people and preach on reading for about a month. Read. Okay. Well, this is the basis of a lot of other books. Separation Illusion by John Whitehead. John Whitehead, who we all probably hold in high esteem. The man that wrote the foreword to that book is Rush Dooney. Uh, Chris, uh, Christianity and the Constitution by Idesmo. Idesmo, the foreword there by D. James Kennedy. Um, and Idesmo uh, is a part of the Witherspoon School of Law, which goes all over the country lecturing young lawyers on American history. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Look at, oh, me is really. Uh, other, other books come on the scene. Uh, that became very popular among the public now. Faith and Freedom by Benjamin Hart. Benjamin Hart, personal friends of Rush Limbaugh. Uh, Faith and Freedom, 327 pages, all about the Christian roots of American liberty, and there's not one mention of the Baptists. How in the world can you write a book about liberty in America and not mention the Baptists? How could you do that? He did it. He's in the mail order business now, by the way. The Myth of Separation by David Barton. Here's the Myth of Separation. The all-important idea of the separation of church and state. Listen, you now know why, what that means, don't you? You now know that separation of church and state means a separation from the old world order. That's exactly what it means. So on this all-important issue of separation, which he calls a myth, Think about it. And that all-important thing, and by the way, I think David Barton's a fine man. I really do. But how in the world can you write 197, no, 275 pages about the myth of separation and never mention John Clark, never mention John Leland, never mention Roger Williams? How could you write a book about that and not mention us? And then market it to Christian school kids. Yep. I help us, Jesus. I, I don't know how many times I've shared this, but every time I, my reaction is the same way. I want to go out and punch somebody. And Christian love. All right. 
Here's America's God and country. Here the, I bet you, I'm telling you right now, I bet you 90% of Baptist preachers have this book in their library. It has a, a, a lot of wonderful quotes in it. It really does. But you know, in this, I don't know how many pages this thing is. It's a bunch of 690 pages. There's only one quote by, the, by any of the founders who were Baptists or were influenced by the Baptists or give any kind of Baptist heritage at all. There's only one quote, and it's a quote by Roger Williams, and he never even said it. I know Bill Fetter. He lives in St. Louis. I know him personally. He left us out. And he quotes David Barton right and left, and he leaves us out. All this is based on the same ideas. All right. The American public's being reconstructed on what the history of our nation is. In the myth of separation, David Barton, David Barton gives special honor to Peter Marshall and David Manuel. That's where he got his ideas, reading Reformed writers. See. Ray Sutton said, hopefully the Baptists of America will continue to Listen to and read the writings of Augustinians. Here they are. They don't tell you they are, but their base philosophy is not Baptist principles. And we keep reading them over and over. One more thing for your edification, all right? Here's somebody that has been reading Augustinian stuff. This is John Piper. Who is John Piper? Ask your preacher. He might know John Piper. John Piper is a pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis. He's a very influential Reformed writer. He wrote a book, Desiring God, which a lot of independent Baptists. He's very influential among independent Baptists in the North, becoming more influential as the days go by. Here's what he said. This happened, I promise you, this happened eight weeks ago. He goes before his, his congregation because he's been meeting with the elders of the church, and the elders in him decide that, that they want to change membership uh, stipulations. In other words, up to now, it's just been, if you're a believer and you've been immersed, you can be a member, right? Here's the change they want to make. We want to allow the possibility that a person may become a member who's not been baptized by immersion. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, if you... Do, if you That's like McDonald's saying, we have decided we will no longer sell McDonald's food. <laughs> Piper says, the Council of Elders believes that membership at Bethlehem should move towards being roughly the same as the requirements for membership in the universal body of Christ. Where, where do you get those kind of ideas? The universal body of Christ. I believe his name is Augustine. Because you didn't get it from the Apostle Paul. Look at here. It's troubling that we require agreement on the doctrine of baptism, but not on more important matters. Like the nature of God's sovereign grace, the way of salvation by effectual calling, the gift of faith, the nature and power of depravity. And it's just like John Calvin's talking to us here. He says, all those things are more important than agreeing on the time and mode of baptism in my judgment. All of them, the great reformed truths that we love. When Balthasar Hubmeyer was preaching throughout Europe, and he was preaching in the 15th century and it took a lot of courage. He repudiated his infant baptism and he began to immerse believers. Hugh Meyer baptized something like 12,000 converts in Moravia. An unbelievable feat. They finally caught up with him and shipped him to Austria for his trial. And his wife and his children went with him. And they found him guilty of heresy. And so before a public crowd, they strangled him first and burnt his body to a crisp. When they were finished with that, they took the pieces that were left and the ashes and they put all of that into a bag 
And they announced to the crowd that they were going to take this Baptist preacher's ashes and throw them in the Danube. The next day when they went to the bridge overlooking the Danube, men got off their horses and they took the bag out and they were throwing the remains of Hugh Meyer into the water. And on the bank there was his wife and his children. When the magistrate saw that they were over there, he commanded two of the troops to go over. And ladies and gentlemen, those magistrate, those troops went over and they took that lady and those children and they marched them into the Danube River until the water was to their waist. And then they took their hands and they shoved that woman's head under the water. And they took those children and they shoved their heads under the water. And they held those Baptist people under that water until they were lifeless. And then they released them. And one man looked at the other and said, permanently baptized. You know, Mr. Piper can say that's unimportant all he wants to. But I don't believe for one minute it's not important to God. He'd been reading too much Augustinian literature. I wonder if he picked it up in his Christian school. We need to get reconnected with our heritage. We really do.